Hello! So today we're going to look at a story in The Spark of Modernism, 20 Speculative Stories and Writings that Defined an Era, 1886-1939, to 1939, edited by William Gillard, James Ryder, and Robert Stauffer. So the story we're going to look at is Luella Miller. <laughs> and this is just an amazing story. It's about an energy vampire, which is quite different from most of the vampires you hear about, and it's a very um, intriguing story for many different reasons. But let's first go into Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, who is the person who wrote it. Mary was born in 1852, and her family was fairly strict. They lived in New England. Uh, they moved to, to Vermont. And her father died, her mother died, and her sister died. So suddenly she was left with nobody at all to support her or to talk to or anything at all. And she had gone to college, so she was an educated woman. So she decided that she was not just going to marry some random guy to be able to have food on the table. Instead, she moved in with her best friend and she wrote. And she wrote stories well enough for a number of different places that she was able to make a living on writing. And she maintained this living, and it was only in 1902. So she was, um, what is that, nearly 50? Yeah, just about 50. When she married a doctor, and one has to wonder why she married him. He was a uh, not a practicing doctor, and he was very much a womanizer, and drank a lot, and read forces, and all that kind of stuff. And she was happy with him for a couple years, and then he just uh, tipped over into all of his addictions and had to go off into a uh, care facility. So she only had a few years with him that she was, we could say, happy but And then she went back to living on her own and taking care of herself again. And she lived until she was 77, so she had a very good long life in general. But she she ran most of that on her own terms, living with her best friend. There's some people who wonder if you know maybe she and her best friend were a little more than just friends because of the length of time they were together and all of the support that they gave each other. And you can see a lot of those same kinds of thoughts in the works that she writes. Um, it's important to remember, I mean, she's writing back in the 1800s. This was not a time period that was very open to women's rights. And many of the stories that she writes, especially the spooky and spiritual ones, are uh, very thinly veiled attempts to talk about the poor role of women and that they can't do anything on their own and that men are always in control of all of the things that they're doing and so on. So they are great stories on their own, but also they have many layers of meaning, which uh, always makes the story much more interesting to me. So Luella Miller. In the Luella Miller story, we have a tale set in New England, which is where she liked to tell her tales. And it's set with New England style dialogue, which a lot of readers from all over the world enjoyed reading because they got to get a real flavor of what New England was like at this time period. And it's a really good story, too, so it has all sorts of uh, things going for it. So we hear this is being told at the beginning from a omniscient kind of voice. It's someone who knows the story and its details. And then it goes into a particular person telling the story. So all of this is a story being told from a voice and not that we're actually following along with the people in the story and hearing what is happening in a... Uh, we'll say first person view or a clean view. So we have questions of whether we're being told the story accurately or not based on who is telling us the story. So we start with the omniscient view. So we learned that there was a house that Luella Miller lived in and Luella Miller had an evil name in the village. And at this point she'd been dead for years. So we're looking back at this and they're saying that even from this vantage point of long past danger, the kids wouldn't play near this house that Luella Miller lived in. The neighbors would be nervous about it. And ever since Luella Miller's dead body had been carried out of it, the house had been completely empty except for one person who was a vagrant who went into the house because they had nowhere else to stay. And the vagrant only lasted in the house for a week before they ended up dying in there. And that, of course, made the local villagers <laughs> even more nervous about the house having evil powers, never mind that the... Luella Miller, who had lived there, had done all sorts of nasty things and had died. So there was only one person left in this village who, af who actually knew Luella Miller when she had been alive. And it had been uh, nearly half a century since she had passed away, so this was long in the past. So we'll say if this was written in, what, 
1902. So they're talking about this person being alive in the 1850s, and they're looking back from 1902 at the stories of what this Luella Miller did. So the person who knew Luella Miller in their youth was a person who was well over 80 at this point, so she had known her when she was in her 30s. And the woman was straight as an arrow, the spring of someone who had been recently let off from the boat, let loose from the boat of life. And she always went to church, rain or shine, so she was a, a God-fearing church woman, and she had never married, and she lived alone across the street from Luella Miller's house. So a, a woman who was elderly, had always been alone, and who was one of the only people left, if not the only person left living, who had known Luella Miller. So it says that this person, who they still haven't named, <laughs> uh, would tell stories about what Lula Bella Mother was like, what she looked like, how she acted, and all this other kind of thing. And according to this woman, um, they finally name her Lydia Anderson. So they're both L-named women, and there are many things that they are similar to each other in. So we've got, we finally get the name Lydia Anderson, is the woman in her 80s, who is the contemporary of Luella Miller and knew her growing up when she was young. So Lydia reported that Luella Miller was slight and she was unbreakable as a willow, glimmering lengths of straight fair hair, softly looped around a lovely face, blue eyes soft, full of soft pleading, clinging hands, a wonderful grace. So Lydia is reporting that Luella was this, you know, model kind of woman, that she was slim and graceful and blonde and willowy and all those other kinds of things. Luella Miller used to sit in a way nobody else could. It was a sight to see her walk. She would walk gently and smoothly. She had green silk she would wear with a hat with green ribbons and a lace veil blowing. So clearly <laughs> Lydia is very fond of the way that Luella looked and uh, thinks that she was very pretty. And she mentions that this outfit she was describing was the one that she wore, Luella, when she married Erastus Miller. Her name before she married was Hill, and there was always a sight of eyes in her name, married or single, sort of implying that she always thought about herself and that I herself was the most important thing in her life. And uh, Lydia reports, Erastus Miller was good looking too, better looking than Luella. And sometimes I used to think Luella wasn't so handsome and that Erastus lived next to her, Lydia, and they went to school together. And people used to talk about that he was uh, interested in her and that he would start courting her. So <laughs> Lydia has uh, skin in the game. She has a reason to be super grumpy with this Luella person because Lydia apparently was going to be the betrothed of Erastus, although she's downplaying it now because she didn't get him. And somehow Luella swept in and took him away from her. So Luella, we now learn, came to town to be a teacher. And back there, so this is, you know, the 1850s. Back then, a teacher could either be a single woman or a man. You know, women were only allowed to work until they got married. It was just a way to pass the time until they got married. And then their only job was to be at home, take care of the house, take care of the kids and that sort of thing. So Luella probably would have been 18 or 19 or something like that coming into this local school system and teaching their little one room schoolhouse that had, you know, all the kids from age, um, from grades one to 12 all together in a room. So we're being told that Luella didn't do the work of teaching. She sat in the back doing some embroidery work. So she at least did know how to embroider stuff. She was embroidering handkerchiefs while she got one of the older children, Lottie, to do the actual teaching. And again, it was just like a one room schoolhouse. So it would be one classroom of kids that this Lottie would be taking care of. And Lottie was really smart, was a great scholar. And Luella had only been there for a year when Lottie faded away and died. So Lottie took over all the work for Luella, got drained dry of her energy, and then died. Now, the school committee knew that Lottie was doing this stuff, but they didn't really care. As long as someone was teaching the kids, they didn't mind too much who it was. And then one of the boys started helping Luella after Lottie died. And he was a good boy, too. But it wasn't going as well with him teaching. And it looked like the school committee might like actually step in 
and complain about Luella not doing the teaching. So Luella decided to get married. And she got married to Erastus Miller, who was the guy who had been interested in our main speaker here. So she, the main speaker, loses Erastus to this school teacher, Luella. And the moment they marry, the kid that had been helping Luella teach the kids <laughs> went crazy. So he didn't die because she turned her attention to Erastus, but he did completely go crazy. So now she's in the house with Erastus, and he, after a year of taking care of Luella, got consumption of the blood. Even though his family had no history of it, he got weaker and weaker. He was taking care of her, feeding her, taking care of the house. He went out in the worst snowstorms to make money to try to take care of her, and then he died. <laughs> He fell on the kitchen floor while he was getting breakfast for her because he just let Luella lay in bed while he made the breakfast and did all the sweeping and washing and ironing and cooking and everything else because he loved Luella so much that he wanted to take care of her. So she just laid in bed and was pretty and he did all the work and then he ended up dying. And his sister, Lily, also helped out with the family and did all the sewing. So even though um, Luella had started doing sewing at the school system. As soon as she got married and she had the sister-in-law that she could get to do the sewing for her, she stopped doing the sewing. And she claims, um, Luella, that she was never strong in the back. But, you know, clearly it also says that uh, the sister was not strong in the back either. So even though the sister was at pain to do it, she did it to save Luella having any pain to do it, the sewing and so on. And then there was also uh, the wedding outfit. Was this other person, Maria Babbitt, did the wedding outfit for nothing and everything else. So Lily, after her brother died, went and moved into the home because she didn't want to leave poor Luella alone um, on her own. So we're still sort of in the omniscient voice because it says, then this woman, Lydia Anderson, who's the woman who's relating all of this stuff, um, would go on to relate the story of Lily Miller. So we are now shifting from the omniscient person who's telling us what Lydia is telling us about Luella Miller to actually the rest of it is all in quotes. So this is the direct dialogue of Lydia Anderson. And I think part of why they did that is because this first part is written in clear English. And then we get into Lydia actually talking, which now is done in uh, New England accented English, which is a little more tricky for non-New Englanders to read, I suppose. So this sort of eases it, us into it. It eases us with a gentler <laughs> phrased dialogue and, and discussions into the actual dialogue of Lydia talking about what was going on. And it says that um, the Lily, who's the sister that came in, started out, you know, fairly hearty, robust and blooming, rosy-cheeked, but she's only been there six months after her um, brother died that she had hollows in her cheeks, shadows in her hair, light died out of her eyes, and she was just completely devoted to her uh, sister-in-law. So now we're into the dialogue section where Lydia Anderson is actually talking and telling us the things that she saw and experienced while she was living right across the street from Luella. So she was, Lydia, was so grumpy with Lily for having killed off the guy that she had planned on marrying, uh, now sucking in the sister of the guy and making her do all the cooking. And she said even when Lily, who's the sister, uh, even when Lily was really feeble and tired, then Lydia would just lay there. Or not Lydia, I'm sorry. Um, Luella, see the names? <laughs> they use names that are so similar to each other on purpose to show that these women are all uh, fairly equal to the way that they are dealt with in life. So we've got Lydia, the woman, telling the story. Lily, the sister, who has come to help. And Luella, who is the energy vampire. So Lily was trying to make food for Lydia, but was just so tired and worn down that she could barely do it. And Lydia appreciated, Lydia, geez, Luella <laughs> appreciated that this food was being made for her, but she didn't lift a finger to help out at all. She wouldn't actually do any work. She would just sit there and uh, wait for her food to be delivered to her. 
So Lily didn't get any help, the sister, until neighbors came in to help her out. And Luella would just eat everything that was given to her, and she would even eat food that was brought in for Lily. So she was um, taking advantage of the neighbor's generosity to get extra food. And it does say, I'll mention that uh, Luella, the energy vampire, did act real fond of Lily, and she pined away considerable too. So it's not like she's wholly heartless, the energy vampire. She cares for the people who are tending to her, but she's also not willing to help or do anything. She just sits there and wants to be pretty and wants to be cared for. So then Lily died, the sister. So now she's killed off the uh, school helper. She's made the second school helper insane. She's killed off her husband and she's killed off the husband's sister who came to help. And now the Aunt Abby Mixter came and as soon as the Aunt Abby Mixter came, Luella became fat and rosy. She became in perfect health. But the Aunt Abby began to start losing her energy and losing her, um, her life force. And someone wrote the Aunt Abby's daughter, <laughs> Mrs. Sam Abbott, who lived in Bear uh, Fairways Away, and told the daughter that the daughter had better come and rescue her, the aunt because um, the aunt was fading and, I mean, three people had already died due to this energy vampire and uh, Abby could easily be the fourth. So we're saying that the aunt was a uh, very benevolent, good person, big square face, tended very tenderly to Luella as if she'd been a baby. And the married daughter tried to get the aunt to come to live with the married daughter and the aunt wouldn't stir because the aunt thought that the daughter could take care of herself and clearly Luella needed her. So she was going to stay with Luella, Luella where she was more needed. So finally the daughter, after writing and writing and not getting any actual useful responses, came down to visit the household of the energy vampire and she was just shocked at how bad her mother looked. The daughter cried and said, please come with me. She's killing you. And... She even told Luella, you have to <laughs> let my mom go. You've already killed your husband and anything else and leave the mom alone. And when she said this, Luella went into hysterics at the thought of being left alone. And Aunt Abby um, refused to leave. So finally, the daughter leaves because she has stuff to do at home. You know, she has kids and stuff. But she's miserable because her mom won't go with her and she knows that her mom is going to die. So then the person telling the story who lived across the street, Lydia, goes over to visit the <laughs> energy vampire and talks to Aunt Abby and says, no, we need to do something about this. And she says, no, I can't, you know, I need to take care of the energy vampire. And in the meantime, the energy vampire is laughing and crying and Aunt Abby is trying to soothe her and take care of her. And the across the street lady is saying, there's nothing the matter with the energy vampire. <laughs> and then she goes, Aunt Abby, you know, goes to still try to take care of her. And the uh, woman across the street says, all right, I'm going to take care of the energy vampire from it. You, Aunt, you need to get to bed because you are completely getting drained of your energy and you are sick. She says, oh, I'm fine. We should have called a doctor for the energy vampire. <laughs> and... The energy vampire is laughing and crying and trying to get attention for herself. And finally, the woman from across the street makes her a uh, concoction to put her to sleep and get her out of the room. So she gives her the concoction and forces it down on her. And sure enough, the energy vampire at least goes to sleep for a little while. The poor Aunt Abby <laughs> is still so drained of energy that she can't even sleep. And the neighbor tries to feed her gruel to keep her going but it's not helping because the energy vampire has drained her so much that there just isn't much life left to her so then we have one of the key scenes so we've got the neighbor woman tending to aunt abby who is on the verge of death because she's the next one in line to be drained dried by the energy vampire and out comes the energy vampire who says geez why hasn't anyone made me coffee yet <laughs> the neighbor says you know what if you want coffee, you're going to have to make it yourself. 
And the energy vampire says, I never made coffee in all my life. <laughs> Erastus always made the coffee as long as he lived, and then Lily made it, and then Aunt Abby made it. I don't think I can make coffee. Now, notice that she's only talking about stuff since she got here. You know, at some point she was a kid living in someone else's house. But, you know, she may just not be mentioning this, but there's never any mention of the energy vampire having a father and mother and such. She's acting like a rich person, but if she's a rich person, she never would have come working as a school person. So one has to imagine she was a, we'll say, middle class person that was educated enough that she could even try for a school person job, but not well off enough that she could have lived without working. And maybe at this point, she'd already killed off her father and mother and other siblings, having them take care of her. And once they all died and she had no money left, she had to go and be a school teacher somewhere completely new where no one knew about her um, devious <laughs> habits. So anyway... <laughs> She's saying, I need coffee. Someone should make me coffee. The neighbor is saying, go make it yourself, you fiend. And then the energy vampire says, well, can't Aunt Abby get up out of bed and make me some coffee? And the neighbor says, no, she's sick. She's sick because you're killing all of them. And Luella says, is Aunt Abby sick? <laughs> so she's a little dense here. And, you know, on one hand, you could say she's doing this all deviously and maliciously, but a lot of the sense you get here is that she's just completely clueless and not really aware of the effect she's having on people. And she just expects, you know, well, everyone's always given me coffee and fed me. Why isn't it happening now? So then the neighbor launches into her <laughs> saying, you know, the, your, help, your current helper is sick. She's going to die and you're going to be left alone and you're going to have to take care of yourself. And, you know, you better wake up and stop doing this to people and so on. And Finally, the daughter of the aunt arrives because she's come back again because she knows her mother's about to die. And um, I think, in fact, she's died at this point. Yes, so, so just as the daughter gets there, the mother has died. So the daughter is now furious. <laughs> so the daughter goes stomping in and talks to the energy vampire and, you know, tells her off and says, you know, you're killing all these people. Can't you take care of yourself? This is ridiculous. Why are you killing all these people? And the doctor who is there, of course, feels sorry for the poor energy vampire. Why are people yelling at this poor, beautiful energy vampire? This is just awful. So the doctor is there tending to the poor energy vampire with her beautiful blonde hair and her beautiful pale skin and her beautiful blue eyes and so on. So Aunt Abby gets buried. <laughs> the daughter goes off miserable. And now the doctor is coming around to see Luella. And Luella is all healthy and happy because now she's feeding off of the doctor. And she's got a nice young doctor. So the neighbor goes over to see what's going on at this point. A spinster neighbor, Maria Brown, had taken it upon herself to come over and start helping and doing all the cooking and cleaning and everything else for Luella because Maria felt sorry for Luella. So now we've got a new victim who should know better at this point and who has taken over the job of watching over poor little innocent Luella. Maria Brown, the servant, is washing and ironing and baking and everything, and Luella just sits there and rocks in her rocking chair. So sure enough, Maria, the new servant, starts to fade away and she, when people tried to warn her, she got really angry and said, oh, everyone should take care of Luella. Luella's a wonderful person. So the neighbor goes over and says, where's your little helper? And she says, oh, the helper had to go home. Apparently she hasn't done her own dishes in two weeks because she's been taking care of me. And the neighbor says, you know what? <laughs> Maybe this person should be taking care of herself and not taking care of you because you should be able to take care of yourself. And Luella looks at the neighbor like she was a baby and she laughs as innocent as you please and says, oh, I can't do the work myself, Miss Anderson. I never did. Maria has to do it. So in her mind, Maria's job is to do the work for her. It can't possibly be that she does the work for herself. Of course, the neighbor says has to do it, has to do it. She doesn't have to do it. She has her own home and she can take care of her own home instead of coming over and dying to take care of your home. And so then uh, the neighbor continues and said, she's killing herself, the servant. 
She's going to die just the way Erastus did, and Lily and your Aunt Abby, you're killing her just as you did them. I don't know what it is about you, but you seem to bring a curse. You kill everyone that is fool enough to care anything about it, you, and do for you. So this sort of shocks Luella, which again makes me think that um, she's not some sort of malicious demon kind of creature, but sort of a clueless creature. And, you know, we'll get to the symbolism later, but uh, that she's a clueless person that just sort of thinks that, well, this is the way life is. I sit here and I look pretty and people just come around and take care of me. And it's a natural thing. So then the neighbor says, you know, you're not just going to kill Maria, who's your servant right now, but you're going to kill the doctor. And the energy vampire starts crying and says, I'm not going to kill the doctor. <laughs> and the neighbor says, of course you are. And, you know, there's a note that I felt it on account of Erastus, which again is that the person telling the story, the neighbor, is a person who had been in love with Erastus as a young person. And now this woman has come in to her life, taken Erastus away from her, killed him off, and is now moving on to another man. So uh, it says that the neighbor told the energy vampire that she hadn't any business to think of another man after she'd been married to the one who died for her, and that she was a dreadful woman, and so on. So a key part of her anger is that this woman killed off the man that she had loved and had planned on being with. So Luella, the energy vampire, got paler and paler, and finally the uh, neighbor goes home. So it turns out after that, <laughs> Maria dies, the servant. So now the energy vampire doesn't have Maria coming around anymore, and she just has the doctor left to feed off of. But interestingly, it says that the energy vampire acted sort of offish to the doctor, and he didn't go there. And there wasn't anyone to do anything for her. So I sort of get the sense that the energy vampire does say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, people are dying around me. And maybe I shouldn't be getting people to do this for me. But while she does that, so now she's staying away from the doctor because I think she does care for the doctor and doesn't want to kill him. It says that Luella starts going into a decline, just like her husband and Lily and Aunt Abby and so on, and she got to be pretty bad. And she went past from the store with a bundle as if she could hardly crawl. So she is having actual physical symptoms from staying away from people. So she's trying her best not to be near the doctor because she doesn't want to hurt him, and it's causing her to suffer immensely and be able not be able to function well. So... The doctor finally comes up with his medicine chest, and apparently Luella is really sick. But one of the other neighbors, Mrs. Babbitt, reports this and says, All right, I know the energy vampire is really sick, and the doctor says she's really sick, but I can't go help because I've got kids. And as much as this seems like a wild superstition, I can't risk going in there and getting myself killed because who's going to take care of my kids? I have to think about myself first. So the neighbor who's uh, narrating this story says, all right, you know, I don't have, she doesn't say this specifically, but she doesn't have any kids. She's living on her own. You know, she's pretty well set. And she considers how the energy vampire had been Erastus' wife and how he had set his eyes by her. And I made my mind up to go in the next morning and see what I could do. So the reason that the neighbor decides that she's going to go help out is in Erastus's memory, that she loved Erastus so much that she was going to go and help this woman that Erastus had cared for because, um, you know, through process of association, it's sort of helping Erastus in her mind. So as she's preparing the next day to go over and help the energy vampire, she sees that the energy vampire is back healthy again. And apparently... We're told that the doctor got a girl from out of town, Sarah Jones, to come. And the doctor is planning on marrying Luella, and Sarah Jones is going to be the new servant. And Sarah Jones, being out of town, doesn't know about all these uh, sequential deaths, the, the, uh, the newest deaths. And she's going to come help out. And the doctor is going to marry Luella. So now Luella, the energy vampire, has two new victims that she can feed off of, and she's being nice and healthy. So says, Luella hadn't swept since Maria died, 
So the new person, Sarah, goes in and cleans up and everything and washes and irons and so on. And everyone is uh, all happy and joyful. <laughs> so we hear that they're going to be married. But soon, of course, the doctor starts looking poorly. And so now they're worried that the doctor could die before they get married, and the doctor wants to leave his inheritance to Luella. So they want to, die, they want to marry soon so that all the proceeds of the doctor's estate can go to Luella. You know, he could just leave it to her in a will. I don't know why they don't do that. But anyway, they want to get married. But he dies too quickly. So he dies before the minister can even get there. And then a week later, Sarah Jones dies. So people are dying a lot faster now. <laughs> Because they hadn't been there that long before the doctor's dead and Sarah Jones is dead. So she just killed off two people within a week. So now that the townsfolk have seen this latest two people die, they have decided that this energy vampire is completely dangerous. Not another soul in the whole town would lift a finger for her. <laughs> there got to be sort of a panic. Then she, the energy vampire, began to droop in good earnest. So, you know, clearly the energy vampire needs these people to feed on. She's not pretending at it or anything else. She goes into a strong decline if she doesn't have someone to feed on. And the town has decided they are no longer going to be food for her. So she had to go, the energy vampire had to go to the store for herself because no one else would go to the store. The neighbor saw her going past and stopping every two to three steps to rest. And... She wouldn't go out to help her because <laughs> I mean, it's going to suck her dry. But finally, the uh, neighbor decides that she's going to help out a little bit. So she just goes out while the woman's walking home, the energy vampire, and carries some of her supplies to the house and then went home. And then she was sick for two weeks. So just that little interaction of going and walking her home was enough to drain her for two weeks of being sick. So Mrs. Babbitt, the other neighbor, came over and said, you know, you're going to die. If you help her even a tiny bit, you're going to die, so don't do it. <laughs> and uh, the uh, neighbor says, I didn't know whether I was or not, but I considered I had done right by Erastus's wife. So again, it's all couched around. I'm helping the woman that Erastus loved, and since I loved Erastus, I can do this for his memory. So now we're already down to Luella being in such a decline because no one will help her that she's only got two weeks left. She was pretty sick. No one dared near go near her. It was, there's, she's saying, you know, even the house has food in it. It's warm weather. She, she could just sit there and do nothing and then just cook from the food that she's got there. But even so, even though there was nothing to make her sick, she was just uh, falling apart because she didn't have human beings to feed on. So... Finally, after the two weeks, the neighbor decides that she's going to go over and take a look at things. And her neighbor, Mrs. Babbitt, came over and said that she didn't see any uh, cooking fire smoke. And someone had to go in and check on the energy vampire. But, of course, Mrs. Babbitt wouldn't do it because she's got children. And just going into the house at this point could probably kill someone off. So Lydia, the neighbor, decides that she'll go over and take a look. And even though she had been laying in bed sick she got herself out of bed and went there and sure enough Luella was laying in bed and she was dining dying and Luella lasted that day and into the night and a new doctor came because she'd killed off the previous doctor and no one else dared to go in there besides the new doctor and about midnight so she's only been there a day and a night and by midnight uh, Lydia has to go home and get some medicine because she was already feeling completely awful just by sitting near the energy vampire for that long. And there was a full moon, and as Lydia starts to go back across the street to Luella's to see how she's doing, Lydia saw something strange. So she says she saw, uh, in essence, the ghost of Luella being helped by her ex-husband Erastus and Lily, Erastus' sister, and Aunt Abby, and Maria, the first servant, and the doctor that she nearly married, and Sarah, the second servant, all of them were helping her out the door, and then they all flew together, and then they all disappeared. So all these people who had loved her and died for her were all still in love with her and all came to help her along to move into the afterlife. So the uh, speaker, Lydia, the neighbor, goes into the house because <laughs> she clearly has a death wish and she sure enough finds that Luella's dead. So she finds Luella dead on her bed. 
So this is the end of the story that Lydia tells. So Lydia tells the story of all the um, people that Luella had killed and that it ends with Luella dying and the ghosts of the other people taking her away. And this was 50 years ago. So then 50 years go past with uh, Lydia just telling this story over and over to everyone can hear and that house sits there empty for 50 years. And now we get a after story which is told by the omniscient narrator that was starting the story before. So we hear that Lydia, the neighbor who lived in the house across the street, died when she was 87. So she'd been telling this story from when she was probably 30 or so until when she was 87 uh, about this person who had died and she was the only person left who had ever known her. So it says that uh, Lydia had been perfectly healthy for her entire life. So, you know, she recovered from whatever the odd effects are from Luella and went on to live a long, happy, healthy life, uh, never married, but uh, like going to church and like just being a part of the community. And when she was 87, she was, um, says about two weeks before her death, she started getting sick. So a neighbor had come to sit with her and to keep an eye on her. And on a bright moonlit evening, um, she is sitting by a window and she goes racing out of the house and there was, had been a neighbor taking care of her, but the neighbor couldn't stop her from racing out of the house. And the neighbor followed along and found Lydia stretched on the ground before the door of Luella Miller's deserted house and Lydia was dead. So we don't know what Lydia saw that she went running over for. Maybe she saw the ghosts of Erastus and Luella and all the rest of them calling to her and she went running over and then she died. And then it says the next night after Lydia died, um, they burned the house down. Someone, <laughs> the house mysteriously burned down because people were completely sick of it. You have to wonder why they hadn't burned it down in the 50 years in between, but maybe the fact that Lydia died right in front of the house was the final straw, and they decided that they were just going to burn it down. Nothing was left of it except a few old cellar stones, and in the summer there was a helpless trail of morning glories among the weeds, which might be considered emblematic of Luella herself. So this is a uh, very active energy vampire. Again, not what I would say a malicious energy vampire. She seemed truly sad at the thought of the doctor dying because of her, and she tried to keep away from the doctor, but uh, nearly killed her, and then the doctor came anyway, and she ended up feeding on the doctor and the doctor's helper until they were both dead. And in the end, you know, the ghosts of the other people came back for her still and still loved her enough that they wanted to help her along to the afterlife. So they still loved her. They didn't blame her for being an energy vampire and for sucking them dry. So in terms of <laughs> what the author, Freeman, was thinking about while she was writing this whole energy vampire thing, if we think about the way that women were back in the 1850s to 1900s, Women were generally not allowed to do much for themselves depending on their class. So if you were a worker class, then clearly you had to work and slave for other people and uh, kill yourself in essence to help them. And her mother was a worker class person who had to work and slave and try to uh, do everything she could for the wealthy class. And the wealthy class people would just sit there in a chair and say, oh, I think dinner sh it should be dinner time now. And then a bevy of servants would run around and make her dinner and bring her dinner. And then she'd say, oh, you know, the fire needs to be stoked. And the servant would come running over and stoke the fire. And, oh, the lights in my eyes. And <laughs> someone would come and close the curtains for them. So there were women of the upper class who were like this energy vampire. And that's part of what Freeman's getting at is that they don't think of themselves as wrong or malicious. It's just the way that they've been raised to think, oh, I shouldn't do something for myself. And they could even be um, ostracized if they tried to do things for themselves. You know, they could have their other peer mates say, oh, why are your hands dirty from cooking? This is silly. You should be the one being fed, not doing the cooking. So her point is that the woman and also some of the men are all busy killing themselves to help this one beautiful, slender woman have a peaceful life. And the woman isn't maliciously asking for everyone to do it. She's just smiling and being pretty, and she appreciates what they're doing. But it never even occurs to her that she could possibly do things for herself. I can't make coffee for myself. 
Um, she does do a little sewing at the beginning, so she knows she can sew for herself, but it's always oh, just too painful. So someone else should sew for me, even though it's painful for them, but it's <laughs> clearly not a direct relationship in her mind of how these kinds of things work. And the energy vampire dies pretty quickly, all things considered, because you know she starts at, let's say, 18 or 19 when she's going to school, uh, teaching the school. She arrives at the school, we'll say she's 18 or 19, she's a beautiful young blue-eyed girl. She marries Erastus. He only lasts about a year. Then the sister of Erastus moves in. Then the aunt of Erastus moves in. They don't last very long. And then at that point, she's got the uh, extra people moving in and the doctor's taking care of her. And then the doctor, you know, pretty much dies pretty quickly. So the energy vampire <laughs> does not have a long life. She must have um, would have done better for her to move to a different town and then lure people in with her beauty instead of trying to stay in this same town. Maybe she didn't have enough energy to move to a different town. She should have married the doctor, gotten him to move her to a different town, and then have a new pool of people to be able to prey on. But apparently she didn't think about things like that. And again, a lot of this comes from uh, Freeman's own life, the way that her mother was treated. And even when she marries the doctor and she becomes in the upper class and sees how the upper class women expect all the servants to go scurrying around and take care of them. So she sees these things for herself of how women are either treated like the pretty object that can't possibly do anything for themselves or the servant that has to work their fingers to the bone to take care of other people. So a intriguing energy vampire story. There aren't very many energy vampire stories compared with, you know, uh, blood-sucking vampires or other kinds of monsters that are out there. And it's intriguing because it isn't a person doing it out of deliberate maliciousness, but someone who is doing it just because they think it's the natural way that things should be, and they feel a little guilty about it once they realize that they're hurting people. So let me know your thoughts on Luella Miller, and let me know if you enjoy the writings in general of Freeman. I mean, she's written all sorts of really good works. Um, all right, I won't give the details of any of the other ones because I don't want to give out any spoilers beyond the spoilers in here, but uh, take a look at the other things that um, Mary Freeman has written. She has a number of stories that are very powerful and great to read. So I would love to hear your thoughts. And again, this is The Spark of Modernism, 20 Speculative Stories and Writings that Defined an Era, 1886 to 1939, by William Gillard, James Ryder, and Robert Stauffer.